everyone. Um, this is CSO session three, NGO Forum on ADB, a decade of safeguards, lessons from the ground. Um, well, first of all, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and thank you for joining us. I am Ryan Hassan with the NGO Forum on ADB, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Over the course of this week, the 55th annual meeting is being hosted virtually by the Asian Development Bank with the theme, Positioning Climate Resilient Green Economy for the Post-COVID-19 World. As the ADB is gearing towards revisiting its 2009 safeguard policy, this session will critically reflect the gaps in the proposed policy architecture, challenges in the current implementation on the ground, and existing limitations. The panel will also discuss important issues related to debt, labor, gender, indigenous peoples in relation to ADB safeguards implementation and operations. This session will also be using the pigeonhole live for the Q&A session, which I officially start this panel. I'd like to introduce to you to Mr. Bruce Dunn, Director of Safeguards in ADB's Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. He leads the team in ensuring the implementation of environmental and social safeguard policy principles and good practices in ADB operations. He also oversees the current review of ADB safeguard policy and will shed more light on where things are, are going right now. Bruce, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. And good day to everyone joining the session. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. And to start with, I'd really like to express my great appreciation for the NGO Forum on ADB for actually organizing this session. It's really well placed to feed into the ongoing update of the safeguard policy statement, as, as Ryan said. So, um, you know, timing couldn't be better. Now, for just setting the scene uh, to this session, I'd like to provide you with just a brief overview on the status of the policy update and then highlight some of the key issues and some of the directions that we're considering at this moment. And the first point really is to emphasize that our overall objective is to strengthen the safeguard policy and its implementation. Uh, you know, we know that we need to protect people in the environment across all of the types of projects that ADB finances. So, so that's very much our goal. And the directions for this are heavily guided by the uh, ADB Independent Evaluations Department which completed in 2020 a review of the effectiveness of the safeguard policy statement. And that pointed to a number of issues um, and provided some important recommendations, which ADB's management endorsed in full. Uh, so our task now is really to take those recommendations forward into the new policy. And as this is evolving, I think what you can expect to see is a new policy that is broader in scope and we're striving towards having a policy that's grounded on international good practice, but one that would also address some of the critical gaps that we do have in the existing policy framework. You know, it has been more than a decade. Uh, so of course there are issues we have to address. Uh, plus another important element is to increase harmonization with the policies of other multilateral financial institutions. Because a lot of our clients do rely on co-finance from different sources and we think we need to be more harmonized. But this very much means upwards harmonization. And we need to strive towards having a policy uh, that meets the, the types of work that we do, uh, both in our public and our private sector work, and for the different types of financing modalities and instruments that the ADB provides. Uh, so there's quite a lot that we need to consider in this framework. Now, we've been working for some time on the policy update. And we've actually completed a series of 18 analytical studies, and we've had a lot of consultations to date uh, with our developing member countries, uh, with our private sector clients, and, and of course, with civil society. And we're also conducting, at the moment, we're in the process of organizing a series of consultations with affected people. Uh, these are people that have been uh, affected by some of our past projects in order to get a better understanding about how projects have affected them on the ground and what we need to, to do to improve that. Um, it's a pretty, pretty interesting process for us. And actually, I, I, I do have to thank uh, the NGO Forum for this because it was something that 
you push for, and, and I'm really glad that we are actually doing it now. Um, we're learning a lot from it. Now, the consultation so far, uh, we've actually had about 2,000 people join them, and we've had more than 80 separate events. And really, I have to say we've had a lot of excellent contributions from civil society. And, and again, I want to thank people that have attended those sessions. Um, we're now working, uh, going through all of the, the studies again, and we're looking at the inputs that you've provided and feeding those in to uh, the ongoing drafting process. So that's a bit of background, but what I wanted to do now was uh, speak a bit about the policy directions. Where are we heading and why? And I'll take a few minutes at this point to step you through some of the key points just as background context. Um, so first, we understand that we need to take a more integrated approach to assessing and managing environmental and social risks. The current policy, as I think many of you know, focuses on three main areas, environment, involuntary resettlement, and indigenous people safeguards. But they're somewhat fragmented, and, and this is something that we do need to address. Just for example, um, we need to do a better job at assessing the impacts to nature and ecosystems and then understanding the dynamics of how those affect and support people's livelihoods. Second, we propose to increase focus on gender equality and on risks to vulnerable and disadvantaged people. This would include, for example, greater focus on people in poverty, as well as people of uh, different uh, ethnic backgrounds and indigenous people, uh, children and youth, the elderly and people with disabilities. Plus, we also need to ensure equality and non-discrimination, which includes addressing risks for all people, including people of different sexual orientation and gender identity. Third, and as part of this increased focus on social issues, ADB will be adding a new standard on labour and working conditions, building off what we had previously in our social protection strategy as well as aligning more closely with that of other multilateral financial institutions. This is going to provide some coverage, of course, on the core labour standards, as well as focus on safe, fair and equitable working conditions and with grievance redress mechanisms for workers. And we'll also be giving focus on labour risks in supply chains. Fourth, we're reviewing and looking to strengthen all of the existing policy requirements on environmental issues, including things like pollution prevention, on resource efficiency, on community health and safety, and on biodiversity conservation, as well as cultural heritage. And I want to just step you through a few brief highlights on some of those issues. Uh, first, uh, integration of climate change. And we're in the process of actually now considering to have a separate standard on climate change. Uh, but we will be including, um, as a starting point, uh, provisions on the assessment and management of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, with lower thresholds than the current policy, as well as integrating climate risk screening at the project and community levels. There will also be increased focus on biodiversity. And some of the things that we need to include here is, is really pushing more upstream. Uh, we need to give more emphasis to alternatives assessment and to avoiding impacts on biodiversity, including for natural and critical habitats, as well as more selective use on criteria for biodiversity offsets. Plus, there'll be requirements for assessing and managing risks to communities and workers' health and safety, as well as addressing risks of sexual abuse, exploitation and harassment for both workers and affected people. Then fifth, we will have an expansion of the current policy framework for involuntary resettlement. And this will cover, um, as well as involuntary resettlement, also voluntary forms of land acquisition and land use restrictions. Plus, we're planning to strengthen focus on livelihood restoration requirements and to develop guidance for land valuation. This is something that we're working on now, as well as addressing legacy issues. Sixth, we're currently reviewing the policy requirements for Indigenous people 
including moving to integrate requirements for free prior and informed consent or FPIC, while also strengthening culturally appropriate impact assessment and consultations. And this is something actually we need to uh, focus a lot more on uh, with Indigenous people themselves, and we're in the process of establishing an advisory group for that purpose. And then finally, on the standards, and I would probably say uh, one of the most important areas is the development of a dedicated standard on stakeholder engagement, information disclosure and grievance redress mechanisms. You know, this is really critical because one of the things that we have seen is some of the challenges in having adequate stakeholder consultation and information disclosure. It really all starts here and it has to be done, I think as you know many in the CSO community, has to be done earlier. It has to be customised to the needs of the communities and the culture that we're working in. And it really does need to continue all the way through project preparation and implementation. And I think this is an area where there has to be a lot more capacity development and support for our uh, borrowers and clients. Uh, plus, finally, on stakeholder engagement, um, we understand the need for creating a, a safe space for affected people and civil society to raise their concerns. And to address this, we're proposing to have uh, provisions on uh, no retaliation or no tolerance for retaliation. And we'll be looking further at protocols and procedures to support the implementation of that through the new policy. So, you know, all in all, this is a more ambitious agenda for ADB uh, to have stronger and better safeguards. And apart from the policy itself, we also need to focus on the implementation. I mean, at the end of the day, this is what, what's most critical, right? So uh, there's a few additional points I want to highlight here. Um, one is that the policy should have a greater focus on enhanced risk screening so that we can you know, obviously understand the risks, but also allocate more resources to the types of projects that need them. Uh, plus, we're looking to integrate contextual risks. And this is important because we need to not only understand, you know, what is the type of project, but where is it? Who will implement it? And what sort of capacity do they have? As well as factors such as conflict, security, fragility and governance. Uh, plus special needs, uh, for example, the implementation of projects in small island developing states. These all have unique challenges that we need to rise up to in the new policy implementation. Uh, two, we're going to be supporting the preparation of more extensive guidance materials. That, that's something that the IED's uh, evaluation pointed out the need for. Uh, we're going to prepare and consult on those. Plus, there will be a uh, capacity development program for our developing members and clients. And then thirdly, we'll be working towards the mobilisation of additional staffing resources, uh, particularly to strengthen some of the, the newer areas, like on labour and working conditions or on uh, things like gender and sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. And we'll be seeking to enhance our portfolio monitoring and our organisational arrangements, as well as getting more staffing down into the operations and the resident missions. So there's quite a bit to be done there. So looking ahead, uh, we're planning for the first full public disclosure of the draft policy in January. And we've been doing a lot of consultations, but uh, we need to make the full policy available so that you can look at the details. And then we're extending actually our, our plans for taking this to our board. Uh, we'll be looking at final board consideration, uh, not before October 2023. So, so we still have a little bit more time. Uh, and this is really primarily to allow us to have more time for consultations. So, you know, bringing this all together, uh, I, again, really need to thank you for your support. And I do believe that with your support, we can achieve, you know, a better policy we need to make sure it hits better outcomes on the ground so that we can address those risks and, and really protect people and the environment uh, across all of the projects that we support. So, look, thanks very much. And I'm looking forward to hearing the other presentations today and, uh, you know, enjoying a, a good consultation session. So, you know, thanks very much. And I'll pass back to you, Ryan. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, can you hear me? All right. Um, so moving forward, um, I would like to call upon Anne, and she'll probably go a little bit deeper into 
the policy architecture, which is currently being proposed. Ms. Annabel Pereiras is the NGO Forum on ADB's project data analyst, and she's also the point person for the network on safeguards concerns. So over to you, Anne. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So the Asian Development Bank is at the opportune time in revisiting its current 2009 uh, safeguards policy statement. So without oversimplifying uh, the importance of the policy, in essence, it is meant to protect the environment and uh, project affected people's lives and livelihoods from any harm caused by these uh, so-called development projects financed by the bank. We also recognize the massive collective effort by CSOs and uh, community struggles in contributing to the current policy. Nonetheless, a decade and two years since its adoption, it exposes cracks on the existing policy and its limitations. What have we learned and uh, painstakingly must experience for the bank to act upon on? And I'm speaking in terms as uh, specific thematic issues will also be tackled by my colleagues in this panel. So first off, uh, this might still come out as a surprise, but despite the efforts that ADB is claiming, there is still not enough awareness of ADB projects at the community level. And this can be as simple as not knowing what exactly the title of a project when concerns arise, like in the early case in Sri Lanka's Northern Province Sustainable Fisheries Development Project. Similarly, this is extended in the project affected people's lack of capacity in not being able to determine outright, for instance, what tranche a project is, if it falls under a multi-tranche financing facility. We have seen this in the case of the Kolkata Environmental Improvement Investment Project and in the Accelerating Infrastructure Investment Facility, both of which are in India. Now, this creates a uh, snowball effect for project-affected people in availing what possible recourse of action they might take. Project-affected people, whether they are uh, fishing folk communities, street vendors, or laborers, are not expected to be well-versed with ADB policies, as rightly so. Even before their lives and livelihoods will be impacted, the onus is on the bank exercising due diligence and oversight over the borrower and implementing agencies to ensure that communities are adequately equipped with information they can use so that they will be rightly protected. Secondly, and I think uh, Bruce have also touched upon this, uh, we have also seen that ADB could do better in screening projects for its risks, categorization, and most importantly, in identifying who will be negatively affected. This would have prevented the fisher folk from suffering the irreversible loss of their livelihood due to the thermal pollution from the power plant in the ADB-backed uh, Mundra Ultra Mega Power Project in India. In ADB's compliance review report, it identified that the single most important concern in the said review is the fact that uh, fisher folk were not considered as project affected people or stakeholders until late during project implementation. Now, as a result of which, they were not adequately consulted when environmental assessments were prepared, which led to lack of mitigation measures that were considered. So again, information, consultation, and participation remain to be the persisting subject of complaints filed at ADB's accountability mechanism. Now, with respect to projects being categorized as financial intermediaries, we have also seen that the current language in the safeguards policy in terms of screening is inadequate and vague. It fails then to capture the complexities and risks of a financial intermediary, just like the labor rights violations in the construction of the Kiratpur Manali Nushok, a four-lane sub-project under the Accelerating Infrastructure Investment Facility Fund in India. Now, ADB's Asia Renewable Energy Asia Fund supported as one of its sub-projects in the Philippines, the Philippines Hybrid Energy Systems, or FESI. There were complaints from the Fisher Folk community during the construction 
of an access road that caused siltation at the Verdaro Bay, which was the source of their livelihood. All FIs appear to be treated as Category C to veer away from complying to specific safeguard requirements. There is also no disclosure of sub-projects being financed by these financial intermediary, which compounds the difficulty of acquiring information and assisting communities affected by these sub-projects. Nonetheless, along these lines of project screening and meaningful consultation, it is a positive development to hear uh, from the ADB Safeguards team to talk about incorporating contextual analysis into the screening of projects, not only limiting it to project impacts, but also in terms of looking at the issues of fragility, governance, security, and even human rights issues. The question then that remains is how will this be couched in the new proposed policy and how will this be implemented? Third, we have also seen the inconsistency of safeguards delivery across different regional departments, as well as with the private sector operations department. We are fully aware that the bulk and type of projects being financed can also be one of the reasons why other departments particularly the South Asia Regional Department, for instance, significantly receive a lot more project concerns or even leading to complaints filed at ADB's accountability mechanism. Now, if there are issues harping on safeguards delivery at the ADB level itself, we also question how is the bank adequately cascading its safeguard policy to the borrowers, implementing agencies, including companies and contractors, carrying out the work. Lastly, these gaps and lessons on safeguards should be viewed interconnectedly in terms of implementation with the other two equally important policies of the bank, its access to information policy and the accountability mechanism, including the operations manual. If the bank intends to craft a genuine, progressive safeguards policy that is relevant to the existing times, it should entail taking off from the past and existing hard lessons on safeguard implementations. There can be no genuine development in reducing poverty in Asia-Pacific when communities' rights and livelihoods are trampled upon. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I think you raised the very central issue of ADB safeguards delivery and all the challenges which go around um, making sure that people get protected on the ground. And on that very same note, I would call upon the next speaker, Mr. Hemanta Witanage is the executive director and co-founder of Sri Lanka-based Center for Environmental Justice. He's also been the former IC chair of the NGO Forum on ADB and will speak on um, issues on the ground and especially the ongoing debt crisis and humanitarian crisis in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Hamanta. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, actually, uh, my job is now to bring some of the lessons from the ground. So I think my, my first lesson is lack of awareness and lack of consultation with regard to the, uh, the projects. And, um, and our finding is that uh, until now, many of the people don't know about the safeguard policies. Um, and also, uh, it is because of the lack of consultation as well as uh, information disclosure uh, issues. Um, and further, when the monitoring missions uh, come to um, come to visit these project sites, they don't consult the um, public or they don't uh, consult the environmental watchdogs uh, who are really um, monitoring these kind of projects. Um, so, and and we recently found that so there are some other people in the project steering committees, but uh, the civil society is not part of those project steering committees. Um, and, and one other issue, um, when it comes to the 
project uh, I- monitoring, uh, it's very hard for the civil society to go to these uh, project uh, construction sites. Um, and especially when, when some of those uh, uh, contractors are very, very strict on the civil society, especially when the NGOs are visiting those sites. So they were expecting some trouble. So therefore, uh, so we although we hear some of those issues that we are not allowed to visit those places. Um, one of the example I, I, I use in, in this uh, explain this slide is actually uh, the Upper Alahara Canal project, which was designed to carry out uh, Moragahakan, the, uh, the water to the dry zone reservoirs. Um, actually, ADB is one of the funding agency among five different other funding agencies. Um, the, the problem is, um, although the technical feasibility was done, um, uh, so they have not found that um, the elephant gathering, the major elephant gathering in Sri Lanka, it, which is a place called a, a tank called Mineria tank and also the Kaudula tank was not properly identified. And because of that, we have lost huge amount of tourism money. And this is the, the, the greatest elephant gathering in Sri Lanka. And according to some of the, uh, some of the experts, we lost about 23 billion US dollars um, about 128 million, sorry, 28.3 uh, billion Sri Lankan rupees and about 128 million US dollars uh, because of the, the losing of this uh, project. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the second issue I want to bring is the weak national regulations. Of course, we have identified this kind of issues for a long time and the ADB um, also looked into the uh, harmonization of some of these uh, the project even just now bruce mentioned about upward harmonization um, and i we found that national ea is still very very big and in in our countries uh, although adb has has reviewed their safeguard policies for few times i think our safeguard our our ea process is still very very old one um, and also there's no uh, n- n- good national monitoring system i think there are so many projects for our agencies to monitor but they don't have any uh, separate f- budget for monitoring so therefore the moni- monitoring is is not really happening um and because there was no upward harmonization i think the the, the local or the national laws are very very weak compared to the the safeguard policies even though you have um, a, a, a comparatively better safeguard policy, um, it, it is not really uh, useful in some of the cases. And especially when it comes to the financial intermediary projects, um, uh, because they are not doing not, not going through the proper um, environmental impact assessment process, there are so many um, the safeguard issues we can identify. Um, one of the very good example, again, on the Manda, Manda wind power project, um, I, I would, I would um, uh, commend ADB on on putting uh, right right uh, mitigation into this particular project, and and it is and is one of the best uh, um, environmentally safeguard protected project in 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 my understanding. But un, uh, under the national uh, laws, uh, they have done an initial environmental examination, and they have already passed the the approved the project. But when it comes to the ADB policy. Uh, so they they prepared the in, environmental impact assessment and we were able to convince the asian development bank to put a, a, a emergency radar system to 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 do the shutdown when the birds are are reaching uh, in in that area and and this is located within the um, within the a- asian bird highway and sri lanka is one of the important bird migration location but unfortunately now there are private uh, private companies are going to come and we don't know how they are going to operate uh, because they will be treated under the a, a, the national laws um, and if there was an up, upward harmonization um, i think we could have resolved that that issue but uh, at the moment we are very weak on uh, on on this issue uh, next slide please um, my third lesson is actually the uh, the uh, inadequacy of the of the safeguard policies because we we all know that uh, indigenous people um, environment and 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 the re- involved resettlement are the three issues that so currently we are dealing with but but there are many other issues like the climate change climate refugees uh, or the climate induced migration um, and the project in uh, in disputed lands 
and cultural heritage. And I know some of the projects in Sri Lanka, they have they have destroyed almost like 49 cultural um, cultural heritage, heritage sites just for an irrigation project. And, and some of them are very important. And they, 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 they promise that they will remove some of those uh, sites and, and relocate in certain areas, but it, it didn't happen. Um, it, it's not, of course, un, under the ADB. This is a different money. It has come from China, but uh, but uh, these are some of the issues um, that we could include into the into the future safeguard policies. And of course, uh, the other point is the co-labor standard. So, my 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 comment is on 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 this. Um, actually, uh, so we need beyond the three things um, in the in the ADB safeguards. Uh, to include because the the current issues are are, are beyond those uh, three issues when it comes to the safeguards. Um, the next slide, please. And the lesson four about co-financing. Actually, co-financing weakened the implementation of safeguards. Uh, the very same project I was referring um, the the Moragahakan the project. Um, so it it involved China Development Bank, JICA, Kuwait Fund. Um, ADB as well as the national government. So when when the issues come and we were not able to identify which one is responsible, which funding agency is responsible, of course the Asian Development Bank has the safeguard policies, but when it comes to other banks, they don't have the safeguard policies. So um, so if we want to make those uh, interventions and and we don't know um, who how we can. We can uh, contact the uh, the other agencies, um, and and this has actually confused the people, um, and and especially when the Chinese company involved in the cleaning cleaning one of, uh, one of the reserve forest area uh, for access roads, and uh, we had hard time identifying who are the uh, the one responsible. So therefore, I think the co-financing confuses. Um, I, I think we need some sort of a solution. For the people, um, especially in these cases, the implementing agencies also were not very helpful for us. The last thing um, about uh, the economic crisis, of course, this morning also I raised this issue with um, the, the president, ADB president. Um, the economic crisis actually weakened the implementation of the safeguard. I think this is a serious issue for Sri Lanka, but not only for Sri Lanka, the many other countries are going through the to the death crisis, so I think so. This is impacting the project, um, the implementation, especially the monitoring. Um, so um, when it comes to the to the more uh, priority areas like the food crisis, energy energy situation, energy crisis, and things like that, I think um, the the safeguards are not really the the priority for them. Um, and we also found that there are number of illegitimate debts. Um, in, in Sri Lanka and we are actually asking, we are demanding those uh, creditors um, to, to cancel those illegitimate debt. I think this is this is a concept that uh, uh, some of the countries were able to cancel some of the debts. I think Sri Lanka is in, in, in that situation. Um, but uh, so in the, the issue is actually when a country get bankrupted, so uh, the safeguards um, is, is, is not really possible to implement. So I think um, those are the four areas, five areas that I want to bring to your attention. Um, I hope um, the uh, the implementation issues are much more uh, serious at the moment. So as a as a as a person coming from a, a developing member country, so I'm more interested about um, the uh, the the these kind of issues. Um, I think um, I, I believe that these issues should be addressed in the in the in the current review thank you so much thank you thank you very much hamanta i think you touched upon some very important points like uh, the weakness of safeguards implementation especially on co-financing projects the broader question around field projects and debt and also you know in some cases when adb has delivered safeguards properly uh, uh, which is an encouraging thing to hear as well now, moving forward, I would like to call upon the president from Freedom from Debt Coalition, Professor Emeritus Dean Reneo of Reneo of the University of the Philippines, and also an international committee member and treasurer of the NGO Forum on ADB. Um, Dean Rene will touch upon ADB's uh, views on protecting labor rights in these new safeguards policy. Is it happening, Dean? What do you think? Over to you. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Can I have the slides? Yeah, my topic is uh, going beyond the aspirational. So towards a full observance of labor safeguards and it's their inclusion in the SPS. So next slide. Well, uh, like uh, Ryan and others, we welcome this uh, review process and uh, for involving us in this uh, review process somehow, uh, because this uh, SPS statement is, uh, uh, this, uh, is the review is overdue, it's 2009. And even the ADBI law joined the uh, book on uh, labor standards, it was even earlier, uh, 2006. Next slide. Yes, the slogan, don't no harm to the environment and the working people and their communities. These are very important, but as I has said, they should go beyond the aspirational. Next slide, please. Safeguards are what they are meant to be prevent any ADB project from inflicting harm to people, preventing violations of the human, labor, cultural, and environmental rights. These are all interrelated. Next slide, please. In this regard, we welcome the findings and recommendations of the ADB's uh, this, uh, uh, 2020 evaluation report on labor and working conditions. They, Sealed in or uh, sealed on this uh, labor and working conditions. Next slide. In particular, and I think these are worth highlighting, uh, they pointed out the lack of clarity on the inclusion of labor safeguards in the SPS and the consequent failure to address related issues of occupational and community health and safety, gender climate change mentioned by Hemanta and so on. And yes, the failure too, very important to our civil society like us to conduct stakeholder engagement, consultation and dialogue. Next slide. May we add that the ADB's 2006 handbook on core labor standards, they, to date, I still have not seen any established monitoring and reporting procedures. It, uh, it's also silent on international rec other internationally recognized labor rights, such as hours of work, overtime pay, minimum wage, occupational safety and health, uh, provisions guaranteeing the rights of workers to air and seek redress for their grievances. Now, this is a very important uh, issue. It's since many of the projects uh, where ADB are distributed, uh, they are not unionized, but it's very important that there's a system of uh, grievance handling. Respect for labor rights should not be based on uh, reporting on a limited number of ILO conventions. That's, uh, that's my problem with the ADB's 2006 handbook uh, because uh, it's focused only on the fuel, like a, a prohibition of forced labor and unemployment of child labor. Next is a slide, please. So what do we want? Briefly, next. We want the, SP, the SPS to be expanded to cover the basic labor rights related to freedom of association, health and safety, hours of work, fair compensation, rest periods, grievance procedure, and others. And link, by the way, there are around 200 uh, ILO labor conventions and over 200 recommendations. But uh, if IADB, if the ADB wants, we can uh, identify which one should be included and link this labor rights with the intertwining community, environmental, and sociocultural rights and concerns of the working people. Because uh, there's always a problem in having a very segmented approach on uh, safeguards. Next. Now, 
uh, how do you crab, uh, or improve the present as uh, SPS? I think uh, I think ADB can be helped by this. Uh, in 2011, you have the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, they came up with a declaration on business and human rights. It can, uh, and also some uh, uh, guidelines. They can be useful in crafting the new guidelines. And also, with the, in 2015, we have the SDG Declaration of the United Nations. And this SDG, by the way, was formally embraced by the Asian Development Bank. Uh, and yet, uh, to date, it's not clear. Or I would like to say the bank still has no mechanism to concretize SDG principles as guide in its operation. And I saw this in the, uh, when they came up with these uh, loans under COVID and uh, okay. uh, they just uh, uh, announced that this, uh, the loans are SDG consistent or compliant, but there are no clear indicators. Uh, so uh, what is happening really is the SPS and the bank's SDG declaration they are very much aspirational, but we want to go beyond the aspirational level. Next. Second, and uh, this is a, a big demand by many of our friends from the trade union movement, make the safeguards binding. That is for a strict observance, not only by employers and contractors, but also by their subcontractors and suppliers at all levels. Usually, uh, from my experience and studies, some of the violations happen at the level, uh, uh, com the bio committed by subcontractors, sometimes subcontractors, subcontractors, sub, 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 and suppliers, but not at the primary level of the contractors that uh, uh, engage with the ADB. So now, one concrete way of doing this is putting the SPS covenant, especially on labor working conditions, part of any contract. Uh, next, please. Thirdly, apply the improved and expanded SPS or standards, not only in future and not only in uh, uh, projects being processed now, but also in existing projects. Now, uh, should they should this be seen as punitive? I think uh, the it should be we should adopt a different attitude. The spirit is to upgrade and align all these projects with the SPS uh, uh, standards or uh, yeah say, uh, safeguards. Uh, next, so yeah, here I listed here it's some way of upgrading. Uh, First of all, they send it really to for a formal orientation with all concerned parties. Uh, you have this uh, training, dialogue, consultation, joint problem solving. Uh, if there are some difficulties in the in the adoption of some uh, uh, rules of safeguards, adoption of necessary adjustments and mitigation measures. I understand this was a part of the discussion yesterday. Uh, the point is a. Uh, to have a uh, just transition, but you cannot have a just transition program without a very clear just transformation program. So for every project. Next, please. So as the evaluation uh, team put it, we must be able to answer the how, not only the what. And next, please. In conclusion, uh, we need indeed, uh, friends, to go beyond the aspirational, beyond the simplistic, and this is the very common simplistic exercise of checking boxes in a checklist tool, one or two page of, uh, with a checklist, and then they just check, 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 but nothing happens. So uh, next uh, slide, please. So in other words, we need to move forward and help transform the bank to become a truly developmental institution for what it uh, 
but, but this is what the bank declares for all, for developmental, for the working people, first and foremost. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Renel. And uh, it's just listening to a big oak tree. And uh, we hope that the words are not falling in vain. Uh, we will come back to Bruce Dunn, Director Bruce Dunn, again later in this panel uh, for him to respond to some of these very critical issues raised. Uh, moving forward, uh, I'm also looking at the pigeonhole. There are a lot of questions in there. We want to make time to address some of those questions. Um, so uh, I'm, I'll encourage people to vote and add in their questions as well. Our next speaker is Ms. Ritu Thapa, who is an advocate and activist focusing on human rights and indigenous women at the Indigenous Women's Legal Awareness Group, or INVOLAG, based in Nepal. Involag has been actively championing the rights of the indigenous Magar community in the ADB-funded Tanaho Hydropower Project, uh, which has already been in the OSPF accountability mechanism process. So over to you, Rituji, uh, to give us the story. Thank you, Ryan Ji. Hello from Nepal. I'm Advocate Ritu Thapa speaking on behalf of the NGO Forum on ADB and CSO. As you know, Tano Hydropower Limited was established as a subsidiary company of Nepal Electricity Authority on 25 March 2012 with installed capacity of 140 megawatt. The project site is situated 150 km west of Kathmandu on Sechi River near Damoli of Tano district in Gandagi province. The project is co-financed by Asian Development Bank, European Investment Bank, and the Japan International Cooperation Agency. The Nepal government approved the Environmental Impact Assessment EIA report in 2009. According to the EIA report, 838 families are affected, and among them, 86 families will be relocated from the project site. The affected families will get cash compensation and land for land, house for house, along with one time and multiple time compensation. It's mentioned in EIA. So, similarly, the draft resettlement of Indigenous Peoples Plan 2012 again mentioned that there are 758 affected households. And again, in updated uh, resettlement of Indigenous Peoples Plan 2018, mentioned that there are 547 affected households. So there is discrepancy among the affected uh, household community. So the RIP 2018 has identified 73% are affected indigenous community and it is their ancestral land. The indigenous peoples are connected with land, territory, river and resources. But the RIP has mentioned that the land affected by the project do not comprise traditional land or ancestral domains of indigenous peoples. No shrines, temple, or other religious structures or sites are regarded as traditionally separate by indigenous peoples. No specific forest land or water body is linked with their rituals, ancestors, and spiritual realms. So it has again mentioned that reef was translated into Nepali and distributed to affected peoples. And villages affected and non-affected have a good understanding of the most frequently discussed and explained items of such meetings, which are land acquisition, resettlement, compensation procedures, asset valuations, timing payments, etc. And none of the owners express any interest in compensation in kind, which is totally false. So the issues of the affected community are lack of meaningful consultation that begins early in the project preparation stage and is carried out on an ongoing basis throughout the project, adequate information that is understandable and re readily accessible to the affected community, which is mentioned in safeguard policy. But, and the ADV has acknowledged the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples on RIP in the safeguard policy. But uh, it is it has not talked about the free prior informed consent, which is compiled by the Tonu Hydro Power Limited, OSPF, or the ADB yet. And there is also insufficient environmental and social assessment. And there is also lack of fair adequate compensation. And there is also discrepancy in compensation. And safeguard policy has ensured the land acquisition process will maintain the same or better income and livelihood status of affected peoples. Similarly, consultations should be free of intimidation or coercion. But the committee people will inform those that if they won't take money from the THL, then they will lose both money and the land. So there is still like a 
enter the intimidation and coercion to the community. And similarly, the landslide and the sand mining making more vulnerable due to climate risk affect communities. Communities have been demanding to stop the project construction till their grievances are readily are adequately addressed and they are properly rehabilitated. It is important for the ADB SEVA to recognize it. And there is no participation of local consultative forum, and there is no like information of safeguard policy and and disclose a draft assessment plan in accessible place and form and language understandable to the affected persons and other stakeholders. But uh, it's it is not uh, happening with the community people and the affected communities has been they have been raising the issue since 2016 by submitting a list of demands to the concerned government authorities and the project that has not responded effectively to those demands. Thus, in Ju July 2018, the committees also filed a complaint to the ADBS OSPF that was declared the complaint ineligible. And on 12th February 2020, the committee again filed complaints with the OSPF and the EIB complaint mechanism, which were found eligible. But the OSPF gives very short notice for the field visit of the consultant experts or provided information much is not in advance during the OSPF. In August 2021, the committee was not consulted at all for the appointment of the land valuation study expert. The OSPF did not share with the committee the report of the land valuation study drafted in January 2020, 2020, 2022 until mass citing serious disagreement of the THL on the study that the OSPF noted the preface to the report. And the report was not even presented by the expert himself, but by an OSPF representative, which is hired by locally in Nepal, and when it is finally disclosed to the committee. So, in the separate policies, uh, number 47, it is mentioned that the ADB will not finance projects that do not comply with its separate policy statement, nor will it finance projects that do not comply with the host country's social and environmental laws and regulation, including those laws implementing host country's obligation under international law. And Tano Hydro Power Limited has been rejecting the land for land compensation and priority only for given for the gas compensation. So in this situation, how the ADP ensure the provision of safeguard policy? And similarly, involuntary resettlement safeguard is to enhance or at least restore the livelihood of displaced all person in real terms relative to pro pre-project levels and to improve the standards of living of the displaced poor and other vulnerable groups. But in fact, it is only in paper. When the ADB properly implemented the safeguard policy and inform, and it has also role to inform all displaced persons if their entitlements and resettlement options pay particular attention to elderly women and children and indigenous peoples and those without legal title to the land. But THL follows the national laws and do, li and do listed the untitled land, how the safeguard policy implement them. So I request the I request the ADB to take mention points of mention points seriously and respect the human rights of the affected indigenous marginalized and vulnerable community by proper implementation of safeguard policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rituji. This is a long going engagement and a very challenging time for the Magar people. Uh, they've been hoping for a resolution for a very long time. Um, and thank you for raising it with uh, the president today in the morning session as well. Um, hopefully we are going to get to some kind of a resolution by the end of all this, fingers crossed. Moving on. Um, to the next speaker, and this is our last speaker from the civil society side, I will call upon Ms. Vidya Dinkar. She's the coordinator for Growth Watch and the current president of the Indian Social Action Forum Network. She dedicated many years of her life fighting for people's rights, including ADB finance projects, such as the Kolkata Environmental Improvement Project. Uh, she's also uh, a complainant and leading the charge on the AIB Finance Bangalore Metro Rail project co-finance with EIB. Over to you, Vidya.
Yes. So I wanted to draw your attention um, to the case of um, four laborers. Um, Liaquat Ali, who is 20, Sabir Alam, 19, Mohammad Alam, 35, and Jahangir Alam, 22, who were made to go down a poisonous manhole, a sewer, uh, under the Kolkata Environment Improvement Investment Program, KEIIP, uh, which is run under the Kolkata Municipal Corporation that aims to create um, a better sewerage operation and water supply in the city of Kolkata, all funded by the Asian Development Bank. Um, on uh, February 25th of 2021, so it's a good long time, uh, a year and a half, um, they were they were all laying the pipes and the trenches had been dug uh, by the ten a tunneling machine, uh, but it needed to be kept dry. Um, and therefore, a leak that was happening in the nearby manhole was required to be fixed rather urgently. There was no technical supervisor at the site, neither from the end of the labor contractor of the KEIP, which is Maxco Engineering, nor from the main contractor for the job, which is SNET, JB, PLJV. A small subcontractor of the main labor contractor, Maxco, uh, a man like uh, called Salman, who had brought in 13 laborers to the project from his own village in interior Bengal. It's, um, it's quite a poor uh, um, uh, place. Um, he asked young Sabir Alam to enter the manhole. Sabir being a first timer, new entrant was completely unaware of the life risk and went down happily without a safety belt. Uh, not even uh, a rope was available. The moment Sabir went down, he became unconscious, fell down. Uh, and Liaquat Ali jumped into the manhole to um, uh, try and rescue him. And he met the same, well, with the same fate. To rescue Sabir and Liaquat, uh, Mohammad Alamgir was the, sec uh, was the third to go down. And the last one was Jahangir uh, Alam. All were drowned and uh, how do you say it? asphyxiated to death. So the level of toxicity was so high that the other three survivors of the team, that is Sariful, Islam, Salman and Mahabul Haq, fell unconscious just by inhaling the emanating toxic gases uh, while they were just standing near the manhole. And they remained unconscious for a very long time until they were hospitalized but were lucky to survive. The Prohibition of Employment as Manual Scavengers and their Rehabilitation Act of 2013 in India prohibits both employment and manual cleaning of sewers and septic tanks, especially without safety gear. And uh, of course, the meager compensation that um, you know uh, the uh, the family of the four deceased got of rupees hundred thousand. No, uh, yeah, it's ten lakhs, which is. 10, 100,000. Okay, I'm very bad at this. So, but that hardly covers anything. Um, Liaquat's young wife, Nusrat, was eight months pregnant at the time of his death, and his baby girl will never know his father and will forever be uh, deprived of his love and affection. And of course, all the families are struggling to survive. We all know the SPS delivery process, the roles and responsibilities of the ADB and its borrowers. The monitoring and implementation arrangements are not really known or understood on the ground, even by those who are actually working there. Bruce mentioned in his preliminary remarks about new standards on labor and working conditions, uh, especially for workers' health and safety. And that was very good to hear. But when we have this elaborate web of contractors and subcontractors that actually undertake uh, project construction on the ground in our countries, how will the ADB actually ensure that these standards are really worth the paper that they are on? How will you monitor project implementation so that, so that those safeguards um, that you have put in place that and that you want to focus on the poor, the workers on your projects and often informal workers like I described, how do you ensure that they are really safeguarded by these safeguards? How are, how are you keeping them safe 
with core labor standards in place, free from discrimination and, of course, uh, risk free. Uh, let me cut to um, another city um, and um, and we can go back to Calcutta because there are more pro uh, problems with the KEIP. Uh, so uh, closer home uh, is Bangalore City. Uh, and um, and uh, we are also going through an ecological crisis. Uh, uh, my group, Growth Watch, has already written about the depletion of green cover through removal of 5,000 trees to make way for a green transport system, uh, the Bangalore Metro. Um, uh, and, and, and these 5,000 have just um, made way for a small stretch of Bangalore Metro, which is funded by the ADB, which they call the airport line. And it caters, of course, to a very small percentage of uh, this burgeoning city. Uh, the impacts of climate change are already visible through um, severe climate vagaries here, and the city has suffered horribly and um, you might have seen these pictures on the net where um, Bang uh, where Bangalore, which is supposed to be the IT capital of, capital of India, was absolutely horribly and severely flooded um, and, we, um, and was clearly unprepared for this flooding. The city's encroached stormwater drainage system has been called out as one of the main reasons of this flooding. And with the Bangalore Metro's Metro uh, airport line being on the same alignment where some of the most severe flooding was experienced this month, we really need the ADB to step in and ensure that the Metro is not the violator of the laws uh, of this land on a design and execution of the project. And for this, we have already sought that the ADB carry out an investigation rather urgently uh, for this really cannot be fixed post facto. We know there are environmental safeguards. There are existing requirements under the SPS for assessing, planning, managing of impacts, preparing environmental impact assessment reports, uh, SIAs, information disclosure, undertaking of consultation, establishment of grievance re uh, redressal mechanisms and safeguards, monitoring and reporting. What we have seen with the Bangalore Metro Airport Line project is that there's been a worrying pattern of splitting of the um, metro line project and release of its impact on the environment in packages and further sub packages just for that short line that have been about 10 announcements um, just like in the previous stretches of the metro so you split enabling um, the project implementer bmrcl but the bangalore metro rail corporation limited to put forth the number of trees to be felt for its projects in small bits and pieces so quite naturally those concerns such as us even the um, deputy conservator of forest and other bangalore municipality uh, environmental and urban experts uh, are all pushed into a state of complete confusion when confronted with portions instead of the whole picture. So clearing every proposal that BMRCL sends in is the way uh, the metro has been made wait for. And the lack of a clear, transparent, cumulative information is really ruining our cityscape of Bangalore, the lung spaces and urban diversity, biodiversity, and rendering us all the more vulnerable to climate change. So um, uh, the idea of meaningful consultation has really lost all its meaning with this uh, packaging um, in small bits and pieces. I'm completely running out of time, I see. But um, what I would like to say is um, there is also the aspect in Kolkata of the uh, Churial Canal, one of the canals, the waterways, um, where um, uh, where um, it's been completely encroached and concretized under the KEIP. Um, and uh, the act of a forceful conversion of a canal to a sewer, really, by neglecting and then destroying the city's um, age-old sewerage system is absolutely not acceptable and a violation of all environmental long norms. Uh, along with the ecological damage, the social and socio-environmental costs are severe. And after the project work began, water logging after a 
even a minimum rainfall has become a common problem for the local residents in the catchment area of the Churial. And flooding in the Behala area has become uh, regularly something that is carried uh, by newspapers. Why have we not complained yet? We have brought out a small report on this, but we are, why have we not taken it to the ADB yet? Because when we took a related um, issue to the ADB and the South Asian department that we sat with, we saw that there was no redress. And, and instead, uh, the complainants were made to appear like um, they were not saying the right things. So what you're hearing from the ground uh, needs to be, I think, ground-truthed. And um, Bruce... Um, we would be so done with the safeguards uh, process, Mr. Bruce Dunn, but we are still engaging in good faith and we need some answers. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya, for a very powerful input. Uh, just reminds me of a title of a book written by Jim Kim in 2000, Dying for Growth. And um, uh, back then he was quite progressive. Later on, he changed views once he became World Bank uh, president. Uh, these are acceptable losses in the name of development, according to the narrative proposed by multilateral development banks. But clearly, those loss of life is unacceptable for the loved ones left grieving. And uh, the tree felling in Bangalore, the loss of life due to failure in occupational safety hazards, the water logging because of Churial Canal, these are all real problems and have not been addressed by ADB SPS 2009. So a uh, lot of stories, including uh, from Rituji and uh, Hemanta and Dean Rene. Over to you, Bruce, for an initial response. But just for the sake of process, there are 14 questions in the pigeonhole, and there's a lot of interest. We have 200 participants watching this. Uh, we want to address all of those questions. Uh, so for the sake of time, Bruce, I think all of them are geared towards you, so you'll have to manage your talking time a little bit. So over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Ryan. And um, I, I really want to appreciate the inputs um, from, from all the speakers that have just gone through obviously some really important points that have been raised. Uh, many of them speak to the the challenges and issues with with implementation. And uh, I mean, this is something also that I respect. I mean, having uh, the, the policy is the starting point, and we do want to strengthen the policy and make sure that the requirements are absolutely uh, clear and broader and more detailed and uh, to have elaborated guidance. But it's really what happens um, on the ground that that's matters. And that's really where we need to, to focus more attention. So look, I, I really appreciate it, all of the examples that everyone's gone through. And th there's a lot of details. Um, I, I think we won't be able to necessarily do justice to that in the 20 minutes or so that we've got uh, left available to us today. But uh, I think with all of these points, we will certainly um, follow up, uh, including, I, I think, the rich points that are coming through in the, uh, the Q&A in the chat. If we're not able to address them all today, we can come back to them. I uh, also want to, you know, say um, the, the points raised, you know, obviously from video, um, loss of life, unremediated impacts. I mean, that's not certainly anything that ADB would want to see and, and certainly not myself would want to see. I mean, it's it's pretty saddening. And I'll come to more of some of those points afterwards, but, um, you know, it's certainly something that we need to look into more. Um, anyway, I'll go through some of the uh, the key points that, that have been mentioned. Um, but perhaps in summary, um, before coming back to some of the more specific points that have been raised by the four speakers. Um, one, um, stakeholder consultation and information disclosure really came through pretty strongly from, um, you know, certainly um, three, three of the key speakers. Um, you know, when, when we heard, for example, Anne's um, introduction, uh, also Hamantha raised this, uh, Rene raised it in terms of consultation, uh, Rita certainly with the Tanahu Hydropower Project and Vidya as well. Um, this is something that, that we need to look at at several fronts. One, um, with the new policy, 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at a dedicated standard on stakeholder um, engagement. All projects need to have a dedicated stakeholder engagement plan. Uh, we need to strengthen uh, the whole communications side of that, making it culturally appropriate, working down through the communities. And I recognise also, and, and we're hearing this also from the project affected people's consultations, that you know, getting that information available, um, making sure that it's up to date, making sure that it's timely, um, really is a big challenge. And I think we need to work with our borrowers and clients on that, uh, building capacity, making sure they've got the resources and making sure that we're monitoring and following up on that. But um, there, there's certainly a lot to do. And I, and I think there's also potential collaborations um, with civil society and local communities uh, that, that can help uh, with that information dissemination process. I, I think some of the gaps that we've seen also um, relate to changes in, in project design. Um, this has come up in a number of the projects we've been speaking to recently, uh, where, for example, you know, a certain number of stakeholders were identified at the early stage, uh, but as project designs um, changed or as we got into detailed design, uh, there were additional people um, that, that should have been identified or were identified late and needed more information. So you know, th this is something that we need to uh, work more on. Uh, to see how we can implement that on the ground. Uh, the, the example, for example, was um, uh, thinking back to Anne's presentation um, where she spoke about the, uh, the Munja project and uh, the fisher folk there. I, I understand that you know, in that project um, there were some uh, consultations obviously that were completed for that, but for the fisher folk who was seasonal, um, they were not identified in the original consultation process. And, uh, you know, clearly if you had been there at a different time of year or had reached out in a more comprehensive way, scoping out the issues with local community members, that should have been identified. So, you know, working with the community to be able to scope issues um, is, is clearly something that needs to be, to be done. Um, I'll segue there on livelihoods. I think this is another aspect where um, we're seeking to, to strengthen. Um, on the livelihood side, um, you know, we recognise that uh, people can be affected in, in different ways. They understand, of course, themselves most acutely how they're going to be affected. So, you know, assessing um, and involving people in understanding the, the livelihoods. For example, um, indirect impacts such as uh, restriction on um, access. Um, th this has come up also in, in some of the projects uh, in India, such as um, the, the Kolkata Environment Project, where we've had um, people that are the vendors uh, and where they've had temporary impacts on access because of the construction activities to put in the water supply uh, and sanitation. Uh, you know, so working through those temporary impacts uh, and making sure that people are not worse off, even if it's for a temporary period, um, obviously very critical. Uh, there's a piece of work that we're doing at the moment on the development of um, guidance and training materials on livelihoods assessment, livelihood restoration and development, which we need to roll out uh, working with our clients. Uh, another issue pointed out um, clearly by uh, Hamantha and also others was on uh, the gaps between the national regulations and uh, the, the policy of, of the ADB or others. Um, he provided an example of sort of a good practice where we are providing um, higher standards and, and that's good. I think there are many examples of that that we strive towards. But as we've been doing consultations with governments, uh, they also see this as one of the, the biggest challenges. They have their own legal frameworks. They know their policies uh, better than, than anyone. And, uh, you know, this is obviously a challenge for them when we come with higher standards. So how can we work effectively in that context? Um, what can we do to help build their capacity to implement um, higher standards and for them to actually update their standards? Now, this is something that we're proposing to do more work on. Uh, we want to institute a process to have uh, regular assessments and regular dialogues. Uh, we want to work on, on the sort of knowledge and capacity agenda. Uh, if there's scope also to provide uh, support for updated policies and regulations as we've done in some countries before to strengthen their standards. But, you know, it's, it's an ongoing challenge and, and clearly as we raise the bar with higher standards, then that obviously creates um, more, more challenges with, with those gaps. So the capacity building program is clearly going to be very important. 
Ryan, ju jump in when I'm taking too long here because there's clearly a, a lot of issues to run through. Uh, maybe give me a couple of more points and, and then we can come to others. Sure. Um, thanks. Um, let me touch next on the labour and working conditions. And uh, Renee, uh, you made a lot of great great points in terms of the areas that need to be strengthened on labour and working conditions. And actually, I, I want to assure you that uh, what we're thinking of in terms of the uh, directions for a, a new standard on labour and working conditions goes in the directions that you're suggesting. Uh, there will be a focus on the core labour standards, uh, but we will also look more broadly at a range of working conditions, uh, safe workplaces. Uh, we need to look at, at fair and equitable hiring conditions, um, hours of work, uh, grievance redress uh, procedures. Uh, but, but I think the challenging aspect here, and you speak to this as well, um, is, is really on the implementation side and cascading the requirements down uh, through the, the contracting process and through the legal agreements. Now, now, on that front, actually, we already have uh, legal agreements which require um, the implementation of the core labour standards. Uh, we do some due diligence on that, but we're looking through the new policy to strengthen that and also strengthen monitoring and supervision. Um, and we also link this into um, the, the contracts. Um, but what we see is a big challenge in then yeah, cascading that down uh, to subcontractors and their subcontracts. And, and then you get into these very challenging situations where you may have uh, informal workers uh, coming through, migrant workers. And, and again, to, to that very saddening um, example that Vidya uh, explained uh, in India, um, which I think in, in the Kolkata project, um, I mean, that is not something we, we ever want to see. And I think there's a lot of um, I, I this. Um, contractual provisions, but also training that needs to be done, making sure that uh, anyone who goes on a job site gets the necessary training, uh, that we don't have people doing jobs that are not safe and that they're not trained for, uh, and that there's monitoring provisions, safety equipment, all of this. Uh, a lot of it's in the existing safeguards, but it, it obviously needs to be strengthened. Uh, and another thing that I'll mention there that we're, we're looking at in the new policy is clearer provisions on reporting. Uh, reporting of major incidents and uh, deaths on site, and then how we look at compensation. Um, obviously, you don't want to have deaths on site, but where they uh, may unfortunately occur, they obviously need to be investigated in full. You need to learn from those experiences and build that into to the future work. Um, so obviously, there's a, there's a lot more that needs to be said into that. Um, Ryan, let me get in two, two additional points. Um, grievance redress mechanisms. We've been doing studies on this, and, and I think this also comes out through the work that our um, accountability mechanism does and the work of the Office of the Special Project Facilitator that they do on problem solving. Uh, we need to you know, strength, strengthen their functionality. Uh, we, we've already been doing some work and developing guidance on that, but I, I think a lot comes down to uh, the project by project systems and making sure the capacity is in place to be able to implement those. Um, and, and they need to be faster, they need to be responsive. Um, in the case that, that Rita spoke about uh, with the Tanahu Hydropower Project, um, and we're aware that there have been uh, negotiations on the uh, you know, disputed lands, uh, customary lands, and the rates of compensation that have been happening in that project uh, since 2016. Um, ADB has been involved in trying to help update the resettlement plan and the compensation rates and broker that. There's been a series of negotiations and that's ongoing. Uh, now we do hope that that can conclude in a satisfactory way, but clearly the time that it takes is, is a bit challenge. And, and I recognise for any affected person that has their life disrupted, uh, you know, their life put on hold while these issues are sorted out and, and the stress that goes with that um, is a huge challenge for them. So, so this is something that we need to address systematically. Uh, last you. point I'll come... Did you want to jump Sorry, in? I was going to mention on strategic assessments, but I know time's short. Time's short, and there are just way too many questions. I'm sure the audience. <laughs> all right, Ryan, you, you take it. I think when you question. respond back, you can add in your point, if that's all right, Bruce. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, great. So I'll just uh, use moderator's privilege and take on two points from Gaia because you know the 
waste to energy incinerator issue has not been touched upon in the panel. Uh, one of the points which they're asking is, as a result of ADB's TA, I think the one in Cebu, uh, there's, uh, there is a standing ban on WTE, uh, according to the Philippines government. But the ADB signed a joint venture agreement on WTE, which is undermining the national uh, environmental protection law. Uh, what is your take on that? On a similar note on WTE, on the issue of dioxin and furan, uh, which are toxins related to waste to energy incineration, is ADB considering putting them on the exclusion list as it has been done in the Inter-American Development Bank? Uh, so the, those are two questions there on WTE. If you can answer those straight away, then I'll take on a few more. Sure, thanks, Ron, and, and thanks, Gaia, for those questions. Um, so on waste to energy, uh, it is included in the, um, the energy policy, and, and I know that was just discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, there's work that's being done there on guidance around waste to energy, um, and it clearly uh, should be uh, not your first option. We need to look really at a circular economy approach that uh, prioritises uh, waste reduction, waste minimization, recycling. Uh, of course, there are residuals um, which you will always have in an economy, um, and we do need to look at final waste treatment um, options that are consistent with the national requirements um, and, of course, are, are consistent to the local situation. Um, on the, the standing down in the Philippines, uh, now clearly uh, we could not uh, finance uh, any activities and any activities that are not consistent with national law and requirements. Uh, this is part of our existing policy framework. So, you know, for a government to be able to go forward with a project, it has to be consistent with those. Uh, on the, the dioxins and furans, uh, this can be an issue with uh, waste to energy, particularly uh, older incinerators or incinerators that are not run effectively. And, and that can be an issue if they're not maintained appropriately or if the feedstock uh, is not appropriate. So, so that certainly needs to be looked at as part of any project design. Uh, we're not considering at the moment to have it on uh, the prohibited investments list. As I said, it's um, being considered as part of the energy policy, um, but with guidance around the appropriate use. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, I'll just take the most highly voted ones uh, in sets of three, and maybe you can come to them. Um, the first question is it's anonymous. How will ADB ensure that making recourse for project affected communities easier, accessible, expedient, and cognizant of the demands of the community? On a similar note, uh, the next question is, is ADB already considering how the accountability mechanism will be updated, taking into account uh, the several policy changes and the new integrated approach which you're taking on? And a broader question uh, with five votes, uh, between 2015, uh, 2015 and 2020, over 1 million people were affected by involuntary resettlement, I'm assuming from ADB operations. How do you not only avoid involuntary resettlement in the future and mitigate the legacy of impoverished communities? So those three, if you could take them down quickly. So sure, thanks, Ryan. Again, great questions. Um, so the recourse for affected people, uh, firstly about... Um, obviously engaging them in the process more effectively, stakeholder engagement, as we've been talking about earlier, uh, but also strengthening the grievance redress mechanisms. And that's something that we're giving uh, quite a lot of attention to. Uh, we're developing uh, additional guidance and uh, capacity building activities for our borrowers, and we're looking at how we can strengthen that on the ground. Uh, also under the new policy, we'll be seeking to uh, expand grievance redress mechanisms for different types of affected people, uh, making them more gender sensitive, for example, uh, or covering cases of um, uh, sexual exploitation, abuse uh, and harassment risks where you would need to take a survivor-centred approach. Uh, also grievance redress mechanisms for workers. Uh, but we do need to look at how we can have different tiers within that so that they can uh, be more effectively uh, addressing uh, complaints quickly on the ground before elevating them. Uh, for the accountability mechanism, yes, ADB is looking at a review of the accountability mechanism. Uh, initially, it was seen that that review uh, would wait until the safeguard policy 
uh, update was completed so that it could reflect on what the new policy would look like. Uh, that's still going to be part of the consideration, but we are already actually working on a terms of reference. Um, it's been considered by management and the board uh, to start some early assessment on lessons learned from the accountability mechanism. And, and also, just by the way, um, we, we do produce a, um, a study on lessons learned from the accountability mechanism, which we do every three years. It's a, a joint initiative of the accountability mechanism offices, the independent evaluation department and ourselves on safeguards. We're preparing that uh, currently at the moment. So um, anyway, stay, stay tuned for more information about the update of the policy. Uh, for involuntary resettlement, uh, so uh, I'm not sure, I can't see the, um, the, the full question there, but um, we, of course, do need to look at avoidance, and, and this is the first priority in the existing policy, and of course, um, something that we'll be looking to emphasise uh, even more in the new policy. Uh, we recognise that involuntary resettlement is a, a, a huge impact on people's lives. Um, and it should be avoided where, to the extent wherever possible. And uh, where, it, where it does unfortunately uh, occur, we need to obviously do a, a better job in ensuring that people have uh, replacement costs and, and to address uh, the impacts on their livelihoods. Back to you, Ryan. Thank you, Bruce. I'll just take a few more. Um, how does the ADB plan to redress violations and negative impacts from the gaps in its previous safeguard policy? Will the ADB safeguards commit to international human rights and labor standards? This was from Tala Batangan. On a similar note, uh, another question is, it was mentioned ADB is looking at addressing reprisals. Can you elaborate on processes, steps ADB is considering to ensure safe channels for communities to raise concerns throughout the project? And lastly, uh, on a different note, considering that the safeguards are up for review, how will the safeguards be applied into the ETM or the Early Transition Mechanism projects? Over to you, Bruce. Okay, great, thanks. Another good set of questions. Um, so in terms of addressing violations uh, due to gaps in the existing projects, so you know, firstly, all of the existing projects need to meet the national legal requirements and they need to meet the existing safeguard policy requirements. Uh, any projects that have uh, unremediated impacts, uh, projects would need to go through corrective action plans. Uh, we also would have uh, grievance redress mechanisms ongoing and there is also recourse through the accountability mechanism to, to look at addressing those. Uh, new projects after the uh, new policy is approved would then follow the new requirements. Uh, on reprisals, uh, this is an area that we're doing uh, more work on. Uh, we're looking to both set uh, policy guidance for the ADB. Uh, the new policy will have an environmental and social policy for ADB that sits out the um, policy objectives, principles, due diligence requirements um, overall, as well as uh, the requirements for, for ADB, as well as a set of standards that the borrowers and clients uh, need to meet. Uh, the first thing is, is having that framework in place, um, setting that you know, there's no tolerance for uh, reprisals or retaliation. Uh, then this will cascade also through to different standards in the policy, including on stakeholder engagement. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, the, the, the process is set up in ways that is safe, that also I, I think gives greater options for people to be able to engage uh, anonymously or confidentially, uh, also through the grievance redress mechanisms to be able to provide information uh, in a confidential and safe way. Uh, if, if people obviously don't say, feel safe in that process, uh, then they won't be able to um, effectively get recourse out of it. On the uh, energy transition mechanism, so we're working through this at the moment. Um, in, in the current stage and in the piloting of the ETM, uh, the safeguard policy statement will be applied, um, will be applied in full. Um, there are a set of procedures that we're working through at the moment. Um, any um, coal-fired power station that we'd be seeking to um, have accelerated retirement of, uh, we would go through a process uh, to basically uh, do an audit of the existing facility. Uh, there are some limitations, though, in that the 
uh, projects themselves, uh, the intention is to close them. The intention is also to ensure that we can uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from them. And we want to be able to accelerate closure as quickly as possible. Uh, so there are certain things um, such as uh, structural changes to the existing facilities uh, that, that you wouldn't be able to make because the intention is to close them. Uh, but looking at ongoing operations until they are closed, uh, we'd be looking to uh, ensure that uh, the, the safeguards are applied to that. For example, uh, if there are health and safety issues uh, for workers or communities uh, through the implementation of the, um, the ETM, uh, through to the retirement of the plant, uh, we would need to make sure that those are addressed through the through the safeguards. Uh, for the new policy, uh, we're going to be reviewing that, uh, and I think similar types of approaches would apply in the new policy. Back to you, Ryan. Thank you, Bruce. I think we're officially out of time, and I will take that last minute to thank each and every one of the panelists. A special thanks to Mr. Bruce Dunn for taking the time and answering uh, generously. Uh, this was a very rich discussion and we as NGO Forum on ADB will continue challenging the bank and engaging the safeguards process because our goals are the same. Uh, we want to make sure that the environment and the people are protected and we look towards a new safeguards policy which is pro-people and pro-environment. Thank you all for attending this session. Best of luck with the rest of the annual meeting.